23rd of November, 1932. Professor Dmitry Pletnev, head of the Kremlin Hospital, signs the death warrant of a 30-year-old Russian woman, Nadezhda Aleluyeva. She'd begun life no one special, the daughter of a railwayman from Tiflis in Georgia. But by some historical accident, the man she'd married, Joseph Jugeshvili, grew up to become the most powerful and the most feared ruler of 20th century Russia, Joseph Stalin. Stalin controlled the Soviet Union from the late 1920s to his death in 1953. He's remembered as the war leader who led the Red Army to victory over Nazi Germany. He's remembered as the man who transformed the Soviet Union into an industrial superpower. But just as much, today he's remembered as a tyrant, a dictator, who caused suffering in the Soviet Union on a scale rarely seen in history. 20 million people are thought to have died because of Stalin. Some historians have called him the greatest mass murderer of all time. This is the story of Stalin's terror, focusing on the life and death of his wife. We know the story only indirectly. Most of those too close to the truth, Stalin later had killed. Pletnev, the family doctor, was one of those unfortunates. But before his arrest in 1938, he told what he knew to a nurse in the Kremlin. This reconstruction is based on that account. I met her first in 1927. She was a, a very straightforward woman, Nadezhda, always dressed in plain clothes, no jewellery. I remember she used to wear this simple steel watch on a black band. They, uh, they had a little flat in the Kremlin, just three rooms in the old servants' quarters. Uh, when I first met her, I found it hard to imagine that her husband was so powerful. But Nadezhda, you see, she was a good communist. She had ideals. Her father was a worker, um, a revolutionary. So for her, it was simply the right way to live. Not too hot, is it? No, no, it's, it's fine. I was Stalin's personal doctor. He had heart problems. For an hour each day, I massaged his head and body, tested his food for poison. He, uh, he grew to trust me, but he was difficult. He had mood swings. I sometimes worried for Nadjesta. But she would just laugh and say, Don't worry, I have him well under control. He has so much on his mind. When he comes home, I bring the children, Svetlana and Vasily, in to see him. With them, he's like a lamb. It was touching. She talked of him with such pride. Once she described a rally in Red Square the lines of colourful marchers. She called them slaves who had been freed from their chains and now were masters of their own nation. And Stalin, the father of her children, standing there on Lenin's tomb, his face and Lenin's intertwined on the flags, facing the future together. And she said to me, it made her quite literally numb with joy. No film survives of Nadezhda, just a few photographs. 
some from the early days, before the revolution. Stalin was a member of the Georgian Menshevik party. He robbed trains, held up banks. She was 23 years younger, but she called herself his comrade in arms. With the revolution, they moved to Moscow. He found favor with Lenin. He became party secretary. She, meanwhile, worked in Lenin's office. She was involved. But as the years slipped by, Lenin long dead, Stalin in power, she'd found herself increasingly cooped up in the Kremlin, her life passing her by. And so, this was in 1931, she decided to enroll as a student at the Institute of Commerce. Stalin didn't want her to go, but he could see that she was unhappy, so he agreed. After her first visit to the Institute, she came to me. And I could see that she'd been crying. They were rude to you. Oh, it wasn't that. It's just that none of them would speak to me. The other students. Like they were terrified. Because I am his wife. Am I being silly? Your husband is a very powerful man. Oh, I know that. But power needn't be frightening, unless there's something wrong. But there was something my mother said. Before I was born, my father was arrested by the Tsarist police, the Akrana. They sent him into exile. Throughout my childhood, we knew what it felt like to fear power. Then last year, my mother said to Joseph, well, shouted at him, that Russia felt now just as it had done under the Tsars. Joseph was furious. He still won't speak to her. Well, I've tried to patch things up, but... And to be honest, I had no idea what she was talking about until I saw the faces of those students, the fear. And now that I'm so obviously talking out of turn, I can see the fear in your eyes, too. I think that experience at the Institute, it... it changed her. It made her less trusting. In the Kremlin, she talked to people, asked questions. And she made friends with Krupskaya, Lenin's widow. Krupskaya had no love for Stalin. She said he was no real Bolshevik. And that all that time, he just wanted power for its own sake. And she hated him. Because, she said, he'd used Lenin's memory. Twisted his memory to win power. He loved Lenin. We all did. When I worked for Lenin, every night Joseph would ask me, what did he say? What did he do? Who was he with? You were a spy in Lenin's camp, that's all. By the end, Lenin could see for himself your Joseph was no good. There was a will. Did you know that? It's not talked of now. In his will, Lenin wrote, Comrade Stalin is too rude, too dangerous. Remove him. But the others, Trotsky, Kamenov, Zinoviev, they thought your Joseph was a mere nothing. Pen pusher, party secretary, comrade filing card. That's what they called him, the grey blur. So they ignored the will. More fool them. Lenin had died in 1924. He'd left behind a people in mourning and a struggle for power at the top. With the contents of Lenin's will kept quiet, straight away Stalin had seen how to turn Lenin's death to advantage. Krupskaya wanted a simple burial, no fuss. 
Instead, Stalin turned Lenin into a cult. He had his body embalmed, a tomb built in Red Square, his words printed in bulk like some religious text. And all the time, Stalin played the part of Lenin's humble disciple. Every night, he would spend hours learning Lenin's words, whole paragraphs by heart. I thought... You thought it was devotion. It was ammunition. Lenin had said there must be no divisions in the party. So every time Khamenev made a speech, Trotsky, Zinoviev, beautiful speeches, filled with passion, Stalin found a way of using Lenin against them, quoting some little phrase, twisting its meaning. And so the party would vote. The party, which a secretary he packed with his supporters, and these old Bolsheviks would find themselves accused of splitting from the party line. Till at last, Stalin and the party line became one. Historians still don't agree what it was that drove Stalin on in his climb to the top. Whether he truly cared for the revolution or if he just wanted power. Pletnev agreed with Krupskaya. As Stalin's doctor, his diagnosis, which he kept to himself, was that Stalin was a paranoid megalomaniac, actually mad in his need to have power, and suspicious, fearful of all those around him. He describes how Stalin kept a gun in his pocket at all times. But it's not true to say he was no revolutionary. Lenin had put the revolution on hold. In power, Stalin kick-started it once more. The tragedy was, being so ruthless, he pushed the revolution further than Lenin had ever dared. All that time, Nadiashta was still going to the institute. The other students had begun to trust her. She made friends. In particular, one girl called Nina Karova. And one day, she found Nina reading a letter from her mother in floods of tears. She put her arm around her, but Nina pushed her away. She said, I don't need your sympathy. It won't help my mother dying from hunger. Nadiashta was horrified. She said, we'll send money. But the other students took her aside and explained that money was of no use, that there was famine, and that millions were dying. In the countryside, Nadiezhda heard, Stalin had created scenes of unimaginable horror, a war on the peasantry. It began with collectivization, forcing the peasants into huge state-run farms intended to increase production. But most peasants wanted to hold on to their land, the land Lenin had encouraged them to take. They butchered their sheep and cows rather than hand them over. Meanwhile, the kulaks, the better-off peasants, so-called class enemies, Stalin had rounded up and sent to labor camps in the north and east. Anyone who objected to collectivization was branded a kulak. Some were simply shot out of hand. In this chaos, the food supply to workers in the cities dried up. Stalin sent in requisition squads to seize food, as Lenin had done in the worst days of war communism. But this time they took everything, even the grain to sow the next year's harvest.
In the Ukraine, in the Crimea, in the Caucasus, there's nothing left. Nina's mother says they've already killed the cats and dogs. They make soup out of dandelions and nettles. Every village has a cart to carry away the dead. And anyone who isn't swollen with hunger, the requisition squads have orders to torture until they say where their food is hidden. But there is no food. Nadiesta challenged Stalin, asked him, did he know? As if he wouldn't know. All that time they were exporting grain abroad to buy machines for industry. The famine was quite deliberate. He pushed her aside. He said she was never to leave the Kremlin again. But she went back to the Institute. And then she found that Nina Karova and eight of her friends had been arrested by the secret police. Even to talk of the famine was an offence. If found guilty, you got three to five years in a labour camp, a gulag. At last, Nadiezhda understood the fear she'd seen in her classmates' eyes that first time in the Institute. Russia, of course, had always been a police state. The Tsars had their Okhrana, Lenin his Cheka, but under Stalin, the Gulag population rose from 30,000 to 2 million in just three years. In timber camps in the north, in freezing work complexes in remote parts of eastern Siberia, prisoners suffered intolerable conditions. Hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, died. In desperation, Nadiezhda tried to get her friends released. Nina. No, no, she called Nina. the head of the security police, yes. ordered him to let them go. Immediately. He said he was sorry. They were already dead. What do you mean? Of disease. How can that be? In prison, you understand? Infection and so on. Hello? It's not exactly known what happened in the days that followed. Pletnev saw Nadiezhda just once more, at Stalin's request. She was hysterical, shouting that Stalin was mad, that he'd betrayed the revolution. Later that month, she was seen in a Red Square rally, marching with some students, her hair all over the place. And then on the night of November 22nd, 1932, a gunshot was heard from a room. No one knows exactly how Nadiezhda died. Nowadays, most historians think it was suicide, that she killed herself for shame at Stalin's crimes. Radio broadcasts spoke of natural causes. Meanwhile, the rumors began that Stalin had killed her himself in a fight or in cold blood. At the funeral, it said Stalin turned from her coffin with the words, she died my enemy. Pletnev continued as Stalin's personal doctor for another six years. As before, he'd massage Stalin's body, test his food for poisons. Members of the Politburo would come in, secretaries, they'd talk none of them much minding what they said in front of this doctor. All the while, Pletnev kept notes. In a file which he called On the Bloody Joseph Stalin the First, he recorded details of the next wave of Stalin's terror, the purges. It was terrifying. A wave of arrests right across the Soviet Union. 
tens of thousands of men and women, interrogated, tortured, sent for hard labor, or shot. The purges began in 1934. In revenge, Stalin said, for the murder of Sergei Kirov, the Leningrad party boss. In fact, it's now known Stalin himself had Kirov murdered, killing one rival, then using that death to justify killing more. In the months and years that followed, many old scores were settled. The old Bolsheviks, Sinoviev and Kamenev, put on trial and shot. All those that knew of Lenin's will, all those who opposed collectivization, all those that supported Kirov, disposed of. At the peak of the purge, Stalin is known to have signed the death warrants of up to 3,000 people in one day. In February 1938, Pletnev was given warning his term was coming. The state newspaper Pravda, Truth, published an article planted by Stalin damning Pletnev as a sadist doctor. The article said he liked to bite his patients. It was a way of destroying his reputation before the arrest, which was bound to follow. I went to see Stalin. After Nadjesta's death, he'd given me a car. American. Wonderful car. I think to keep me quiet. Anyway, I... I drove it to Stalin's Dacha. I wanted to see his face. The guards let me through. And I put the newspaper on his desk. The article staring him in the face. He said he knew nothing about it. He said he'd have the editor shot. He was embarrassed. I've never seen him embarrassed before. And I left him. That was yesterday. In the last great show trial of the purges, the Bukharin trial of 1938, Pletnev received 15 years hard labor. At that point, he disappears from history. The nurse to whom he told his story believes he was taken from the court to the Lubyanka prison, and they're shot, like so many others, in the back of the head. <laughs> 